Welcome back for the last panel, and thank you for being here, the state of exhaustion. He doesn't need to be introduced again, but at this point in time, Professor Greg Lambert is here as a distinguished guest and a speaker introducing the Perpetual Peace Project. It is one of the many joint activities we have together. Welcome again. Thank you. And, um... So this is going to be a little bit of a theory and practice session, uh, and uh, so I'll read or uh, speak a bit of a lecture that was prepared as a kind of uh, theoretical context for understanding a long-term initiative called the Perpetual Peace Project uh, that has been engaged since 2008, and since 2011 with institutions and organizations like uh, Art a Curatorial Organization in Philadelphia, the United Nations University, the International Peace Institute, um, uh, several other partners. And then most importantly, for the last two years, we've been preparing a second phase uh, of this project that will be unveiled tonight uh, that entails uh, new video segments. There are already uh, previous platforms or video segments for this project. But uh, it's a partnership uh, with the Center of Humanities at University of Utah. And uh, Nina, who is the director, will, will come up in the la after and open up and talk a little bit about the process of preparing the film segments. There's also then a larger publication, which I'll talk about in the end or in questions uh, that Rosie and I are editing, which is the scope of the project is to use contemporary 21st century voices, scholars, legal theorists, in order to completely redraft Kant's 17. 95 treaties towards a perpetual peace, which is the basis or the platform by which we tried to create uh, collaboration between different institutions and different partners. But today is the partnership and the collaboration for the last two years with Rosie, so. Pax and humanitas. I place both words in Latin as a caution of sorts to remind us of their imperial and Roman origins. As Roman as the wall that surrounds the old city of Utrecht to keep out the barbarians or to keep the civilized within. The wall that in fact is right out the front door here. Therefore I will speak of each word separately in order to, to ask the following question. How did these words first come to be associated with the idea of the university, with its historical or even national, and most importantly imperial formation, particularly from old Europe, which has moved geopolitically to the present via the United States, west to east, as well as from north to south, so that today one often speaks of the Western University as the evolution of a Roman padilla. That is, a place of discipline and training of a new cosmopolitan citizen. The second question I will ask, especially when they appear as they do here, concerning these words in their antique garb, these words are fated to remain in the academy and in the most derogatory sense possible. This is a question. Are these words fated to remain in the academy and in the most derogatory sense possible, merely academic, meaning, as this phrase usually designates, an idea that is lacking in reality? Thus, the second question is how did they first acquire this sense? And how does it again pertain to the idea of the university today? Therefore, first question, first word, Pax. I now translate, peace, la paix, de frieden, freda. Here, let us turn to the opening of Kant's essay on perpetual peace to read the secret meaning of the satirical inscription of the Dutch innkeeper's sign that appears historically in the city of Utrecht during the negotiations of the Treaty of 1713. Whether this hysterical, satirical inscription on the Dutch Keeper's Inn sign, upon which a burial ground was painted above the title Perpetual Peace or Eternal Peace, was this meant for, uh, as an object of mankind in general, or for the rulers of states in particular who are insatiable for war, or merely for the philosophers who, quote, dream this sweet dream? of peace, unquote. This is not clear. The satirical inscription could have three possible meanings. First, for humankind in general, 
in view, in view of all the conflicts that surround us on a daily basis, it could be a sad resignation that the only state of peace belongs to the grave. Second, for the ruler of states who are insatiable for war and violence, it could serve as a reminder that all their dreams of power come to nothing because they are built on houses of sand. Third, for the philosophers who dream the sweet dream of peace, that their ideas are as empty as their heads and have a better, they have a better chance of understanding death than ever arriving at a certain knowledge of peace. What seems to concern Kant at this moment is that his words not be taken all that seriously in that the worldly wise statement not read into the publication of perpetual peace some hidden political intention, some malevolent design against the state or against the prince. And the philosopher's words are therefore purely theoretical expressions of peace. They are harmless, empty, and his, opi and his opinions are like a game played by a pedant or a fool. The worldly politician who looks down from above, from the position of the adult who knows well the realities of peace and war, the permanence of death and violence, views the philosopher's activity as that of a child playing with ideas that he or she knows nothing about. Nevertheless, Kant seems to accept and even affirm this derogatory and childish position and even states it up front as a condition, what he calls his safety clause. That everything he's about to say should retain the appearance of a game. Should not be taking the least bit seriously on face value, except only in the sense that it be understood as a purely theoretical and not understood as opinion to be published before the public as a matter of political debate. For instance, the argument that war is actually evil rather than a sad necessity, that rulers and practical politicians actually conspire together as if in the same breath when they lie to the people that they really want peace when they're actually preparing for the next war. But before starting the game, before going over the rules on the inside of the box, I want to stop for a moment and ask a second question. How did the idea of peace become a game, or worse, the object of a kind of gallows humor, as if in the satirical sign above the Dutch Inn. This is the true intention of Kant's use of this anecdote to begin his essay to underline the fact that according to the historical conditions of the faculties that regulate the degree to which ideas or concepts correspond to reality, the concept of peace either appears like a silly fantasy, a childlike dream, or an empty and abstract concept, worse, something merely academic. And yet, Kant argues that this appearance of the idea is not its natural dress, but is the result of the deformation of the idea itself by a conspiracy of interests that belong to the very origin of the nation state in Kant's time, as well as in our own, a national form whose sovereignty is predicated and absolutely dependent on the right to war, Jus Belein. This, I believe, was in Kant's entire point. One, that it should first of all strike the reader as odd that the term peace should immediately have these associations, which do not naturally seem to belong to the idea of peace itself, but rather address the limitations of our manner of understanding the idea that is our cognition, our imagination, our practical knowledge or lack thereof concerning what the idea represents. But most importantly, according to Kant's notion or what an idea is, it strikes against or it says something about our very desire for the idea's reality. In other words, in this sense, the, if the idea appears abstract, it is because we do not desire the reality of the thing it represents. Of course, Kant himself, in the critique of pure reason, had already classified, classified other certain unreal ideas as ideas of reason, soul, world, and God. But here, unreal, unreal means that they cannot be empirically proven, but are essentially regulative, theoretical, 
since it is by means of these ideas that we aspire towards a final knowledge that is already presupposed in a practice. In each of these cases, Kant claims, the idea allows us to represent in a problematic form the systematic unity towards which we aspire and which we presuppose actually in all empirical studies or in practice. For instance, a peace treaty would have no meaning if it didn't pose the ulti as its ultimate end, a final peace. Again, unreal here is taken here in a special sense or faculty of having a purely theoretical appearance. The soul cannot be empirically proven. The world cannot be viewed in one glance. In accordance with the idea of God, according to Kant, we, quote, consider every connection in the world according to principles of a systematic unity, hence as if they are all risen from a single all-encompassing being as supreme and all-sufficient cause, unquote. Now, what is the idea of peace if not a subspecies of an idea in Kant's architecture that stands for community? In the Kantian system, the idea of that is presupposed as a purely regulative principle of what he calls universal cosmopolitanism, the theoretical and regulative idea that all races and nations will become united at some point in accordance with the principles of a cosmopolitan design. Therefore, quickly, for lack of time, then if this is true, the true appearance of the idea of peace, then how does its theoretical sense take on a further derogatory sense of, mere, of meaning merely academic, an idea fit only for the schools, as one says today, an idea, for example, that could only belong to the humanities? At the beginning of Perpetual Peace, Kant simply assumes this is a fact, an expression of the historical condition of peace, as against the rights of nations and the ruling interests that make up at that time international law. But there is a stronger power that characterizes what be, could, could be called the publicity of peace, causing it to appear as a sweet dream or an object actually of social scorn and mockery when it is spoken by the philosopher in public, which is that pure, the pure idea of peace is an, actually an object of censorship in the public sphere. Now, censorship doesn't always function to suppress. In fact, it rarely functions this way, a bit Foucauldian here, but rather to fundamentally distort or disfigure the degree of reality that belongs to the idea. In fact, under the regime of censorship, we might go on talking about peace all day and all night. We could organize rallies for peace as well as exhibits as long as the degree of reality that pertains to the appearance of the idea remains purely virtual, theoretical, somewhat innocuous. However, the minute that the idea tips over into practical action as a principle that serves a principle of a guiding community, it quickly found, is found immediately to violate some pre-established arrangement between powerful private and public interests and to become an object, scandal, social conflict, and repression, ultimately. This occurs, not being Foucaultian there. So this occurs when the public nature of the idea that serves the guiding and regulative becomes the practical principle and no longer merely theoretical, cultural, artistic, philosophical. That is to say, when its idea, its presentation becomes overtly realistic and public. According to Kant, most political interests are oddly termed in his system private, which is why they take place in secret and outside the public sphere. It also applies to the idea of peace. For the idea of peace to appear in the public sphere, it must first be censored by all the forms of private political interest. For example, the idea of peace is a purely theoretical idea that is presupposed in the political practice of diplomacy as a guiding rule for practical knowledge. However, as a practical idea of diplomacy, in Kant's time as well as in our own, the idea of peace is often a deception, a form of lying, since it is often employed strategically to gain some interest or to enforce some right or to levy some resources and in Kant's words, to prepare for some future war. The real aims of diplomacy are often secret 
and we are not and are not revealed before the public without some deception or diversion of their real political ends, as in the recent revelation of the WikiLeaks vividly demonstrates. In the, re in the reports, in the past few years, governments have designated so much information secret that the number of new secrets designated as such by the US government has risen 75% within the last three years, three to 10 years. At the same time, the number of documents and other communications created using the secrets has skyrocket, skyrocketed in quantity nearly 10 times. The proportion to which a government conducts its principal business and its treaties in secret is equal to the degree that the government is defined by private political interests and represents a conspiracy against the people. In some ways, I would like to characterize Kant's irony or his intention with the perpetual peace as a kind of 18th century antique version of the WikiLeaks. And this is why the fundamental notion of publicity that underwrites everything he writes about universal cosmopolitanism the competing rights of nation states in international law, the secret character of governments as a violation of public reason, and finally, about the existence of censorship that informs the historical contradiction that the idea of peace can only belong to the discourse of philosophy where it is censored and rendered innocuous, if not untranslatable. Rather, he says, and can never because it can never be publicly associated with the prince, or with his dignity. But all this means in practice is that the politician cannot subscribe to the idea of a final unity or cosmopolitan principle of peace because it would directly contradict the right of power itself, the right of the nation and state itself, which is just as much true in Kant's time as it is today. Therefore, if the word peace in its most pacific sense ends up in a university, it means nothing less than the desire for the reality of the idea itself has been summarily and decisively foreclosed from the political sphere, as decisively as in the statement of the sovereign decision by the Schmidian rhetoric as regards the state of exception. However, that the idea still exists even today, and this is what Kant actually hinted at, is nothing less than a miracle where at least it still retains a theoretical function under its abstract and academic existence. And this may also have been Kant's hope. Since the price of its negation, it preserves the possibility of its realization for some future time and for some future generation like our own. At this point, because of lack of time, I can't develop any close examination of the second word, humanitas. But you might imagine that my explanation of how this word also ended up in the university or acquires an academic sense is a result of a similar process, if not an exactly related process of historical abnegation of an idea that often appears abstract in, ex in its origin or which lacks a certain empirical reality. Not so much owing because of the quality of the idea, but because our desires for this idea's reality have become historically perverted as a, huma a humanism that was first of all a Roman humanism, as Heidegger first argued, or has an image of the human that has been deformed by power as in the self-image of the human that Paul Gilroy reminds us is produced by colonial history, citing the passage, famous passage by Fanon. And yet judging by the historical pattern in our neoliberal society has even divested its interest in this image of the human, both historical and anthropological, as a necessary and required area of study in the contemporary institution of the university. Here I would say something similar to what Foucault might have said concerning the subject of man, who already disappeared a long time ago, by the way, is that the pattern of the idea of the humanity's disinvestment is not that of a repression, but rather the gradual and slow realization that such knowledge is no longer necessary to the function of the contemporary forms of interests, economy, and power. 
Let me underline this. We may be approaching a radical moment in the historical revolutions of universities as the form of the school, the pedia, the discipline, the training. As important as the last revolution that occurred in the 18th century, in which we must, we must at least entertain the possibility that in the new curriculum of the future idea of the university, the knowledge of the human may not be required, but will persist only as an elective. But now let me conclude on a more positive note and again invoke the challenge of what Paul Gilroy has called a university of peace and a new image of the human and of a planetary humanism. Let us try and imagine, let us try and imagine the future of a university where these two ideas remain central and no longer merely academic. Peace, perpetually, and humanity, a planetary and not merely global humanity. That these ideas be kept in the university and preserved from a certain destruction precisely by undergoing temporary neg negation is a function that belongs to the past but, and to the guardians invoked by Wendy Brown but also by Kant. Who are these guardians except the philosophers that are referred to in Kant's text of 200 years ago who appear as academics as beneath the dignity of the state but belong to all of the lower faculties. That is to say, today what we refer to as the faculties of the humanities and the social sciences as well as others. That is to say, we are the guardians. And I think that we have discovered the necessary link between these two ideas, which is ourselves. Therefore, to paraphrase a famous line from the Bard, the fault of the humanities is not in the stars. It's in ourselves. In order to repair this fault, it is time to reactivate these ideas, peace and the humanities, through an ideational and creative activity that must be active and even activist, in the sense that the humanities contains a repressed knowledge of the peace that belongs to all humankind. That is nothing less than the future of our disciplines and nothing less than the stake than the future of the idea of the university itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg Lambert, for that uh, poetical, political, philosophical disquisition. Very nice. I just take after my big sister. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> I think we should definitely take a round of questions before we go on to the arts project. Floor is open and Wendy is up and running. Thank you. Yeah. Where peace, especially in a world so ridden by injustice, where peace is often the instrument of, to put it mildly, the dominant. Um, and that doesn't mean I object to mm -hmm. peace. But my greatest worry about humans invested in peace is that it divides us deeply from social scientists mm -hmm. who study conflict, subjugation, mm -hmm. occupation. But they also study, I mean, there are different forms of, for instance, the, the distinction between peace is uh, defined as an absence of violence or conflict. And this is something that Yoli Damers talks about in, a vi in the video segment that we'll talk about, as well as, uh, and I'll talk in response also to why this project was initiated around the concept of peace rather than, rather than other forms of conflict. There's also the positive conditions of peace, in a sense, transformation of the infrastructures um, that support violence, on a, in, both in the daily life. And we talked a lot with Richard Sennett about this when we were bringing a lot of people involved in this, in this project. So I, I don't think that, in fact, many social scientists actually were, uh, got directly involved with the project and began to communicate and invest, in a sense, in the notion of a concept that has been disregarded or placed in such disrepute so that it no longer existed as a critical or political concept. Now, because it has been used, particularly uh, one of the early phases, we began talking to diplomats in the United Nations. It has been used uh, strategically for so long and is no longer, in fact, it is rejected and is not used technically as a term 
uh, within the negotiations. In fact, many, their, a peace treaty as an instrument is not even used to, to a great deal today because of the historical problems with that. It doesn't mean that there's something in the, in the nature of the, of the historical nature of that deformation or of that usage of the idea itself that is important to recover. And it's something that, in a sense, it's not that peace, that we are put, as putting forward peace is only the single idea, but in a sense, my motivation, and this is something that I think I shared when I talked with Rosie about this, is that after uh, 2001, um, and the seeing the responses to the wars and so forth that were, on, that were ongoing. I was really disturbed by the fact that there was so much discussion of violence and about even perpetual war or an acceptance of violence that there never from the left or from different forms of resistance to this or even questions or thinking philosophically about this, the idea of peace as a critical or political concept that we could develop um, was never even, in a sense, approached. It never was raised. We immediately, in a sense, um, were drawn to reproduce, in even our own critique as, and in our philosophies, the war conflict and the spectacles of war and violence as a critical instrument of resistance, of consciousness, and so forth. I think that that has a long history and tradition within critical thought. But I was concerned, and I think that that concern was shared by others, that the concept of peace was not activated in relationship to this historical moment when we have been living through a series of wars that have been naturalized uh, to some degree as, uh, as something that was just an ongoing affair um, of the state, but also of populations. Not only to that, but I think that the idea of using context was that it provided simply a framework or platform for creating a dialogue. A long discussion would go into the fact that the separation of law, legal theory, international law, political science, some political science that belongs to the policy sector uh, outside the university from philosophy, where the concept of peace was in a sense schizophrenically divided between those two sectors in modern societies. So the first stage of the project was to engage in a dialogue with actual diplomats, including the ambassador, the French ambassador to the United Nations, uh, several other, the under, general undersecretary and so forth, to try to get them to actually talk about peace. And it took us a while to actually get them interested, but then they said, this is a very interesting project. One, because Kant's text had the basic blueprint for what later became the League of Nations and then, in a sense, evolved into the United Nations. But two, because we never use the word peace in our daily business. And then secondly, we wanted to bring those, that community into a direct conversation and dialogue with academics and philosophers who never really speak to that, to that, in, to that institution of those intellectual communities and to bring a, a, about a dialogue around peace and international law. So I think that that's one of the, the, the basis of the project was a strategy and a way of, for me, it was a publicity campaign to some degree of raising the question of why peace is absent from our philosophy today, but also as a critical, to try to reactivate and to think through the idea of what is peace as a critical concept outside of precisely all of the historical deformations and denegations that it, that, that term had, uh, had undergone through the, from the 18th century, even before the 18th century, but the 18th century, the 20th century particularly. So that's one way of just kind of in a broad way outlining in a sense. The other thing is that the project could not be simply academic, could not take the form of a book, it had to be a series of initiatives that, that in a sense took place in media. The bringing together in the platform of a video or a film of two groups that would never meet together in the same room was an important aspect too of the project. Can so, I to reply, Wendy? Yeah. Or you? <coughs> um, I don't have a big response, but I, I feel like we have very little time. I, I, I guess I would just offer this. Um, in the most recent run-up to almost war uh, against Syria from the U.S., I found myself actually quite distressed by a peace-oriented left that was m more concerned with a rather... Um, 
I want to say com compulsive and compulsory peace platform than with the question of what it meant to be gassing mm -hmm. human beings and what we should do about it. It would probably involve some kind of multilateral mm -hmm. violence. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to hear what you're talking about when you say peace as a critical concept. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, it's not that I don't think it can be, but discursively and rhetorically today, it has many different valences and functions. But I'm, I'm just wondering how you can um, take on the problem within the project of the um, no justice, no peace cry, right. but also the accusation against um, those from below that they are disturbing the peace, whether mm -hmm. it's those causing the so-called war of the sexes or those causing the so-called uh, disruptions in the cities that have a fantasy mm -hmm. of a once upon a time homogeneity and peacefulness, or those causing the disruption in the West Bank, or mm -hmm. and, right. and so I, I'm it's not I'm not against it. I'm just trying to hear what you're right. talking yeah. about when you say peace as a critical concept. Mm -hmm. Because for me, as a critical concept, it would have to actually take on something in addition to peace. It would have to have a supplement, and I'm, I'm listening for that supplement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I can be brief. Yeah. yeah, I think that... No, 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 but, but, but oh, we have to get correct. Try to answer, but try to be succinct. I, these are a lot of questions came up precisely in, in soliciting a lot of participation in this, and precisely it is. Peace is very complicated, multi-layered. I think that though there's a problem of projecting this one rhetorical homogeneity of, I think that it is a problem with the left today, but we're not speaking about the concept just within the political sphere, or how it's being employed there within the sphere. Right yeah, right. Yeah. right, exactly. It's, it's about right. looking at that. Not only when, and I think with the sphere of international law particularly, I think was the focus, okay. But also within how it has dispersed within other institutions, the academic institutions, within cultural, within cultural and artistic practices and institutions too. Where it is, it is something that needs to be defined, articulated, and then, and then basically to create a critical understanding of, in a sense, that those uses in which is employed today. Bob, and this, can I look around the room? Can we this the last question for this one? So, um, uh, this was very short. It was very clear, but it was very short. So, you had to condense. And I just want to make sure that I understood this, and then I want to, if I got it right, ask the further range of it. It sounds to me as though um, your sense of peace is that it's like a Kantian idea. Um, which therefore could never actually be empirically present um, and guides a kind of inquiry or discourse, a way of thinking, and therefore that's the critical side. It's, that's right. It's not, it's not that we now have peace. We will never actually have it uh, in empirical. And the university um, gets to keep it because nobody else really wants it that much. Um, and uh, because That's they have other interests and other goals, That's right. when they pick it up, they, they end up not getting the real thing at all. That's right. Um, and so the university has to, the university hangs on to it because it, it's become, because in a certain sense it's been subject to a kind of cynical critique of reason, uh, or cynical. And as an idea, so I, I'm, my, I guess my question is, um, is the humanities therefore um, in its sort of, or philosophy perhaps, in its guardian role, the, um, the place where um, ideas which have been um, badly treated, as they always will be, um, it's an, almost inherent in an idea, justice will be badly treated, um, peace will be badly treated, freedom will be badly treated, um, even God and the soul will be badly treated. They, they, go to, they, they don't actually go to um, retire in the university, but they're sort of sustained um, in a kind of suspension or bracket. They're no longer useful, yes. except in their false forms. And so the, is, is, that, so is, is that what the, in some ways, what the humanities is like? It's like a, 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 um, a safe haven or an archive or, or, or some kind of place for guarding these ideas that, so that they can be 
not necessarily deployed in their negative forms, but deployed in their critical forms to say that's not peace, that's not justice, that's yeah. not freedom. Would that, would that? I think, I mean, the conceit of that, you know, that's one, the structure and the function of the university of certain, particularly the ideas of, uh, that, uh, that exist within the university in, in a different form, you know, justice, peace, um, you know, ha take on a critical function precisely because they are absent from other areas of society and from other uses where th that relationship appears as a critical platform for representation. But I wouldn't want to reduce the humanities role to being a depository of the abject or rejected uh, you know, terms, these are not simply, I mean, the, the, the notion of an idea. Remember for Kant, the, the, the idea of peace is the idea, the, the very regulative function of law, but in a sense that, that exists as a principle within the law itself, but not in terms of how law is actually practiced socially. It exists as a principle, but it is not, it doesn't, it emerges as a content within certain fields like philosophy where that, that content is explored historically, anthropologically, and so forth. So that's, I mean, yes, this is very compressed and dense, but that's the Kantian solution is almost an irony of saying the, there's no chance for peace in the present because the nation state is based upon the right of war. The right of war also is the principle of individual right. So that relation of the juridical and legal framework to the individual right, to the right of war, is in a sense condemns the idea of a certain kind of positive construction of peace as a, as a principle of law. So it exists in philosophy for the meantime. And that's the design, his final design was that it exists to be reactivated constantly as a critique of empirical and positivistic law. So. Just a six month seminar at least in this question. We have a new work in definition of the Humanities as the circle of the losers. Yeah. No, uh, a a no. shelter for the beaten up concepts yeah, yeah. that society has rejected. I rather like it. Um, okay, we will make a smooth transition and, um, for this, but I do think we owe our very smart and very lucid speaker a very warm applause. Thank you. Okay. You're going to talk to us oh, yeah, yeah. So this is a kind of tripartite presentation. The second part is actually to show you how complex and how interesting the project is, and I want to, to invite... Well, let me then introduce yeah. the, uh, the yeah. artist-in-residence of the Center for the Humanities, who will then, in her turn, introduce the Dutch leg of this project. Mm -hmm. Nina Pigat um, worked for a while as our uh, organizers and coordinator at the Center for the Humanities, but we were just the day job for her real passion in life, which is documentary filmmaking. And while working uh, for us, um, Nina was able to complete her second major documentary, which was pre-sponsored by Vepero Television and many other important institutions in the Netherlands. And uh, it was, was actually launched at the famous Amsterdam International Documentary Film Festival last year, aired on television in May this year, and is now in the top three shortlisted documentaries for the Dutch Film Awards, which will be De handed out De De when? Debut. Yeah, um, debut, uh, de <laughs> but it will be handed out when? Uh, next week, Wednesday. So next week, Wednesday, <laughs> if you see a flashing uh, announcement on the website of the Center for the Humanities, you will know that our very own Nina Pigat has hit the big jackpot. Give her a very warm round, because she's really wonderful. Nina Pigat. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, so I've been asked, um, because the Centre for Humanities will launch this, uh, the redrafting of Perpetual Peace, um, to talk to you a bit about how um, I approached making the films that are linked to the... Um, oh, sorry. Uh, that are linked to the, to the rewritten articles of, um, of the preliminary articles for Immanuel Kant. Um, so for me, the... Um, my connection to the Perpetual Peace Project started, as Rosie already said, when I was a project coordinator for the, um, for the Center for the Humanities. And um, first day on the job, I actually got the Perpetual Peace Project handed to me. Um, in a box. In a box. <laughs> and uh, run with it. Uh, and what we did was um, we actually uh, recurated an exhibition that had actually taken place in New York um, a year before. Um, and 
what it did was we used the six preliminary articles of Immanuel Kant um, and uh, with that um, interviews with pre pre prestigious academics such as Greg Rosie but also Zazia <laughs> Zassen, um, uh, Helene Sixou and uh, Ashil Mbembe, um, they commented on those articles and what I noticed straight away, and we noticed as well, was that what was missing, what was the missing leg, was although this was like a very visual appealing um, way to translate um, an academic text like this and bring it um, to to academia now, was that it wasn't still wasn't very engaging. It was really difficult to get um, to get academia, but especially well, students. Rosie was engaging. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, we were all engaging, but it was still we were still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we um, we weren't getting there to really engage um, students, um, especially. Um, and then, as I left my job as a project coordinator and started as an artist in residence, um, I could all of a sudden think about the project differently, um, and which I was doing all the time already anyway, I guess. But I was I, I got to think about it in a way that how do you visualize peace? When you think of peace, we can talk about peace and we can, we can put it into an academic context, but how can we actually see peace? And I found this really difficult to do because for me there was no way in which to visualize peace unless you can, unless there is some kind of peaceful action or peaceful intent uh, behind that. Um, so I started thinking about how to translate that that action, and that for me had um, had I did that in two ways. And the first way is I I kept the link to academia, and I did this because um, uh, I very much felt that um, as a student we were very much struggling with questions of we were being inspired by research, we were inspired by academic texts. They were opening our eyes for questions we hadn't even thought of asking before, and they were making us uh, be, be critical and um, engage um, with societies in ways we hadn't done before. But at the same time, we were only thinking about ways of engaging, and we were finding it very difficult to put those texts into action. Um, so this, this notion and this, this drive of mine to think about visualizing peace through an active intent uh, really comes from that, from being a student and actively engaging in academia. Um, and the second form with me, for me, was just really simple. How do you, I mean, what do you do when you're being peaceful? How do you, how do, you do that, right? So, um, and a good friend of mine, uh, Quincy Gallio, he's a spoken word artist, but he's also, in many ways, uh, an, an academic. Um, and he... Um, he has this um, incredible gift to uh, translate academia into poetry. Um, so I asked him, so we, I maintained that structure of the six articles and I asked him to translate uh, the, the preliminary articles by Kant into a po poetic format, uh, which he did beautifully, I think. Um, and from that, um, I remained uh, with interviews with academics to explore themes that I think are really important when you think about peace. And that's um, thinking about reconciliation with the past um, and thinking about slavery and thinking about compassion. Um, and also turning, um, turning around the question towards academics as well. So, so if you're talking about peace, how do you then? How are you a peaceful academic? Um, so, Basically, that's the way that I approached the, approached the articles, and I think in the future, um, I would like to explore that idea of visualizing peace in a much more associative manner. This is still a very, has a very straightforward narrative form, so it's, it becomes understandable, and that's also something that we really wanted to achieve, that it would be understandable for a broader audience. Um, so I'll leave the well, I think opening. If you can see, I, I, I yeah. Need to show, show what you think. Show Just one as a reminder, yeah. Um, the, yeah, the, we'll go on and play the video. Which is, there's six articles, and, if, and a reminder of the structure of uh, the six articles are preliminary articles that have to be fulfilled before any sustainable peace could ever be even exist. So those, so we use those in all of the different initiatives, including an exhibit in the new museum. Yeah. 
a conference that took place in the International Peace Institute in the UN um, that involved diplomats and academics together, including Rosie. Um, then an exhibit that took place here in Utrecht in 2011, and now this next iteration. And it's all these initiatives are gathered under the title The Perpetual Peace Project, which is turned into a bit of a perpetual project as well. <laughs> so, uh, and in perpetual some ways, so that, peace. so that, but just if you remember that the conditions, or the preliminary articles are just a framework that, in a say, that point to the fact that in our current contemporary world, the, the, none of the six conditions have yet to be met. And that is, that peace shall not be made with secret reservations. No state shall by itself acquire another state through you know, donorship or conquering. Standing armies should be abol abolished. There should be no national debts contracted in connect connection with the external fear ah. of the state. No state shall intermeddle by force with the constitution of the government of another state. And no state at war shall adopt such modes of hostility as would necessarily render mutual confidence impossible in a future peace, feast, such as the employment of assassins, poisoners, and the violation of a capitulation. I'll just remind you that we're actually using drones to target um, uh, individuals and groups you know, within a war, and so assassination is being used as a, as, a, as a tool today as well. All of these preliminary conditions are then critiqued in a text, and then Nina has produced a video to complement each one of those articles as a kind of a parallel. So let's go for the video, okay? Once we cross this bridge, we'll have to blow it up. Remain on one side, up a creek without a paddle, down a tree with a cushion of fresh air. On this side, there will be no sides, just awareness. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. الله لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم. إلا بما شاء وسع كرسي السماوات والأرض. Peace. Um. I would go by Galtung, who made already in the 1960s a distinction between negative peace and positive peace. And negative peace is the absence of manifest violence. So, you know, the lack of rioting and killing and maiming and the spectacle of violence that we're so used to. Positive peace, that's the real peace, uh, and that is the absence of structural violence. And Galtung defines structural violence as the violence in the normality of things, the violence in structures, the violence in the way we organize our society. So sort of more the, 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 the diffuse, indirect ways of violence that, for instance, you know, poor health care, um, poverty, underdevelopment. People die because they have lack of access to health care. So they actually die. They die younger because they have a bad food diet. If there's an absence of that kind of violence, that is, that is when we can speak of peace. Compathane, to feel with the other, uh, or to endure something with something else, to put yourself in other people's shoes. In um, Arabic, it's Rahman, and that's related to the word for womb. So uh, it brings in mother love. And the idea of the mother and the child is a sort of central compassion, it's uh, what makes us most hu hu humane. But it's hard work. 
Uh, a mother has to get up every night to her crying child, however exhausted she is. She has to put her own needs to one side and be responsible and know what's happening to that child for every second of the day. A mini second, something terrible can happen. Uh, and then that cute little baby uh, grows up and can become a horrible disappointment. But really the mother doesn't give up. And there's a Buddhist prayer uh, that says, let us cherish all creatures as a mother, her only child. We have to have that same sense of responsibility for other people uh, as a mother has for her child, for all creatures, uh, all species. Um, and this is, this, this is a religious requirement and it's hard work. In, for Buddhism, the word karuna, it means to take responsibility for the pain of others and to work actively to, he, to assuage the suffering of the world. So it's not just a question of saying, oh, I really empathize with your uh, feeling today. Uh, it, 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 it must issue in, in, in practical, realistic and creative action. So tell my kids, what plenty on a day is a very road in days and times. Varum, have you used to call as your house? And it said, Mama, the fever is out flays is flays. The fever is out haze is haze. Ten times men of new reborn is, can I say, um, sit bar a leven, it sit. Um, wait me to wait, but your leven's bestemming is. Mut ye terukir, and that he sit that he drew for ye reborn is. Peace, to work for peace, to be pacific, to be a pacifist, is not a passive life. That there, there is only peace through activity. There's only peace through a kind of industrious energy. That you build peace, you construct peace, you live peace. It's not about doing nothing. That doing nothing is not peaceful. Doing nothing is just being inert. Peace requires movement and action and, and construction and, and thoughtfulness. Take heed of my French doors. Wooden floors, they look better without uninvited footprints. Uncouth glints. Presents that unwrap messily by other tongues than my mother's. Unless, unless spoken by her ilk. Silk. In Western culture, there are these myths that we hold that we don't talk about. They're out there all the time. They completely permeate our culture, but they're, you know, they're just not talked about. And one is about this myth that there is pure evil in the world. This idea that evil exists in its pure forms, always in the people who oppose us. So Saddam Hussein becomes a being of pure evil, right? The Taliban become beings of pure evil. Or who, Hitler becomes a being of pure evil. I'm not saying these were not horrible people and reprehensible things that they did, 
But whenever we can begin to say that any one person is not like us, that they are in fact purely evil, then it begins to open up the license to employ the second great myth, which is the myth of redemptive violence. The idea that we can somehow redeem people by killing them, that we can redeem situations which are difficult by bringing violence in those situations. We see a, a portrayal of civil war Act agents as, um, as greedy and evil. And we see clearly, if you, if you make a discourse analysis of those portrayals, you clearly see the, 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 the portrayal of the source of war and, and violence located in the local evil. Why do we see this transformation? And I think there's a logic to it. There's a logic and there's a need to position the to di for a geopolitical disconnect, to, 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 to cast blame and responsibility at the level of the local. I will my need more to slide. To slide from where all is what I really think and to tell you. I will not more run. Run for a world that I do not begrijp. I will my need more to forget. Forget and for who I have I will not be bang sein. Bang sein for the donkerte, bang sein for the nacht, bang sein um door mensen verstoten to board. As the world of my dad of friend finds, let us see my friend find. So it's a very depoliticized and very moral tale of evil and good that serves a purpose because there is a need to, 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 to impose this geopolitical disconnect, to not tell the story how much violence is interconnected to neoliberal capitalism and to post-colonial um, political infrastructures. That is a very unwelcome story for a number of important uh, powerhouses. So that's kept out of, that's kept out of the storyline. But the truth is no one is purely evil. And the truth is that no redemptive violence will ever bring peace. Violence doesn't bring peace. It brings usually the seeds of more violence. And, that's, and those two myths, if they're not confronted, will just continue to dominate our lives and our cultures. And war, you know, we'll have all of this violence that continues from it. Maybe I can then have, yes, Joan, thank you. Who is the presumed audience for this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, students. For me, it was students because of the first um, um, presentation that we had, and we noticed it was really hard to engage students. Um, so I, I kept on thinking about how do you, how do you engage students so they would see uh, the link to their academic work um, as well as um, an, an active, creative, translation of that, of what they learn. Uh, students of, for instance, uh, conflict studies, uh, practical philosophy, yeah. It's just a bit of, for me, was an answer to the question, how do we get people to read the classics, which is a perennial concern. Kant is by no means my favorite philosopher, but it's almost impossible not to engage with him some way or the other. Uh, I think it's not um, coincidental, as my Marxist friends say, that both Greg and I are trained in French philosophy. And Greg was, I think, supervised by Derrida. I worked in Paris with the masters. So we have that approach that we need to engage with the text, but you can't leave them alone. They have to be desacralized. And um, so that was the first thing that attracted me to it when we brought it to Utrecht. In the first phase, I was just involved in the project as one of the people that were interviewed. That was easier. Bringing it here just forced a whole set of thinking. The other thing that I convinced me is that this is a very powerful text in the sense that it lays the foundations juridical and conceptual for the League of Nations, for a great deal of the articles of the EU, um, for even the, we have here this, you know, the Roosevelt family is originally Dutch, so we have the Roosevelt Academy that gives out 
the, the freedom medals, they're the four fundamental freedoms. I think Hillary Clinton has all four. And those freedoms are really postulated again on these axes that are just so, so Kantian. It's a bit, I don't have to tell you the, the, the importance of neo-Kantianism in the discourse of ethics, which is one of the great problems that we have today. And through the conference, we've talked about how ethics deletes any political discourse. We had a few examples of this this morning when um, the, the partisans of neoliberalism dropped the word ethics in every second, second sentence without defining it. So I thought it was very interesting to engage with that. Um, and uh, then it was only, you know, also the pleasure of trying to tra transfer, transpose concepts into images. I, I, can, I wouldn't know how to do it, but I thought it was very important that this should go into uh, a set of translations. And, and Greg had already started, but I think with Nina we reached sort of a medium, a way um, of doing this. So. You know, to be reminded of Kant, the political thinker, who, who converts his political positions into ethical ones, but you get to see the sleight of hand as he does it, and then you've got something to work with and to argue with. So it's, it's really, um, talk about taking a, 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 a classic theorist away from the Rawlsian, so it's really. <laughs> yeah, in fact, we engaged with a lot of the philosophers who, I mean, like Elizabeth Ellis, a uh, the political theorist that she does on provisional right and law and so forth. We used her as a consultant. I mean, one thing to add, though, is the audience, there have been many audiences. The, each initiative had its own problematic of how to communicate. The problem of publicity, of, of uh, the publicity of the concept or of the audience was essential. There was an exhibit with the new museum. The audience was an art, uh, the audience was the, the going of the new museum. And then that, it, it, that's where the installation of a different kind of exhibition took place. There are previous film segments from the early phase which were all critiqued, violently critiqued. You know, who are you, why did you pick Apia rather than X or Y? Uh, and then, and or that, uh, why would you go and talk to the UN about peace? And and there was a there was there was a great segment which I invite you. The original site is still there, perpetualpeaceproject.org. The videos are there, also through the Humanities Center, where we interview the French ambassador to the UN, and he was hilariously funny, unconscious, because many of the diplomats said, "Oh, peace. We solved that problem with the European Union." Huh. He goes, we it got was, the Nobel Prize yeah, for peace, remember? Yeah, yes, yeah. we got the Nobel Prize. So it was made to solve the German problem. He goes, now peace, now the problem belongs to the rest, other rest of the world. He goes, we are a postmodern society in a modern world. That's what he said. So it's a very, it created these occasions and these slippages that, that then became the basis for a very rich dialogue. There's lots of questions, yeah. I, I just want to follow very closely on that. The relationship between this set of videos and the whole project, is this the, is this the capstone? Is this the summation? Is it a separate component? Uh, um, the, I, if you could just help clarify that a little bit. The, the project is collectively owned. It really was initiated by Syracuse with a, an art foundation and a UN university. And, but it is open access in the sense that anybody who wants to participate then takes it to its own place. And I think you've, maybe Greg in a minute should talk about all the different places where this has been brought and how it's been adapted. Our issue here was how to adapt it for our reality in a center for the humanities in a, in a powerful university where the unthinkability of a lot of positive concepts stares us in the face, and I hope it has stared in your, in your faces during, during this conference. I come from a political culture of feminism where the unthinkability of certain concepts is part of how we grew up. I spent my life um, debating whether it was possible to have a positive understanding of difference, whether or would always difference would have to be always a pejoration, whether it's possible to think in, in itself. And in a sense, peace is part of the family of the unthinkables. It's also a deeply irritating concept. I come from a long line of feminist warriors. This really irks me. However, the more I think about it, the more it opens up a number of paths where the unthinkability turns into a series of challenges and actually opens up new perspectives and keeps sort of some, 
some openness in, in a mind um, that tends to be very sort of self-confident about what concepts are right and what concepts are. So it was for me a very humbling, in that sense, instructive experience. But maybe you can talk about where you took it, to Korea, you took it to some absurd places. It is a It is an open access, open source project that began with a concrete initiative with a cultural foundation and a diplomat in the UN. And it was to try to find a medium to bring, create a dialogue between diplomats and philosophers using the film as a medium. But it's been taken to several universities and each time I've said it belongs to you. Once you take the initiative, you just have to follow a, cer a basic certain format or certain rules, but the content, the problem of how you adapt it. And here the problem was based upon the previous conference that we had and the exhibit in the library where we reproduced the exhibit of the new museum. There were several stations and, and pieces of the film along with Kant's texts around, but the students didn't seem to be interested in it at all. It was really flat. So this became a pragmatic and concrete problem of pedagogy for Nina to approach and to create a new medium that now can be adapted. This website should be used then, can be adapted anywhere as a teaching tool. Next week I'm gonna go and visit a philosophy class here that is actually talking about how to, to, pub, to bring difficult <laughs> philosophical concepts into a different public medium or public space. And this will be an example of one just one way of doing it. So there is no, there is no designated audience. Yeah. So the, the, the extension of this is please adopt it and do something with it in your location. Just contact uh, Greg just for the basics. But uh, we hope that it goes on. I see a hand up at the back. Yeah. Several hands. Uh, I was pleased to see in the video um, please be framed as something that you do, so as an action. And, and actually, when I was listening to your talk, I was a bit puzzled when you said uh, peace is a, a theoretical concept. Uh, I, 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 I was thinking, how can peace be a theoretical concept? So, could you... Yeah, it's, is it's that peace, a, in that, the, the function of an idea has a regulative function that defines a practice. So it's an idea that determines, or a principle of practice. You know, and in a sense, it's theor that's the true sense of the theoretical. Uh, and, and that would take a lot to, to develop, but in a sense, it's, a, it's theoretical in a sense because it serves as a principle of the empirical practice that you take up. The idea also forecasts the result, the goal of that practice as well. So. For me, the question is raised whether, whether you can uh, study and, and think about peace without acting peacefully, without actually, so how, how do you, as well, I don't know if I'm being too presumptuous to say this as a non-academic, but um, isn't that the vice of any academic, or any academic of the humanities that engrosses in theories and has to ask themselves the question, how do I? I mean, for me, as a student, that was that was incredibly difficult. How do I? How do I practice what I preach? I would, I would, um, I think, want to promote reflexive pr practitioners, so people who act and think <coughs> at the same time, yeah. um, <coughs> or, or think about what well, they're doing. Yeah. My, this, is, this is, in a sense, a conception, or at least a, this is a conception of a practice for me, <coughs> and it's a practice that's trying to find ways to communicate. In, with different constituencies, audience, different institutions, and so forth. I don't know what it means to me. It's an idea that has driven me to do this, and I'm not sure why completely. And I'm not going to, in the end, write a book and tell you about it. Okay, so but this, to me, defines right now my practice, almost like an artistic practice. A lot of artists don't know why they paint the same fucking canvas blue or something like that. But I mean, there is something about uh, a process that that, it, that the principle is defining a practice for me in that way. Yeah. Two questions, that will be the last two. Yes, please. Yes, uh, Shalina, I'm, I'm interested in your uh, process in, um, in making a transformation of academic insights into art, because I think it's very difficult. So I'm very interested in your process and did you 
describe that somewhere also, and not only the results, but your process in, in this. And um, if you do so, did you find some um, same things in art as in academic papers or in that process? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, about describing the process, we talked about this, um, that I will put this down on paper and, and describe it as well. Um, uh, where to start? Um, <laughs> I, um, I find it um, difficult, in a sense, to call myself an artist. Um, and I, I, I like to refer to myself as a filmmaker. Um, and I, I, I don't know why. So, um, and for this project, um, especially, and I think um, any time that I, as a filmmaker, um, make something for um, for an idea or for already something that is actually comes from somewhere else and does not come from my own inspiration, how do I bring those two together? Um, it's um, I, I have to. I have to have an affinity with the project, and I have to have. Um, it has to be something that, um, that that speaks to me in some some sort of way. So working on this project um, comes from being a project coordinator first. So I saw the potential of a project and. Um, uh, um, and, and, and I wanted to work with it. If I would work with it now, um, in which, um, and, and think of it completely as a filmmaker, no longer as, a, um, as someone who, who works in, in, in academia or in the academic world, um, I, I would work with much more associative images um, and, and think about that, so really think about how you visualize, visualize peace. This is for me very much still um, showing um, activism and peace, um, but, and still talking about it, but this for me is not um, art in that sense. It's a it's a representation of art, of some forms of art and academia, and bringing that together. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Much more. Last question. Um, I, I think it's a more overall question for the event, but but uh, intrigued. Or what gave rise to my uh, question now was the slide with um, uh, academics, art, and activism. Because um, I, I think last year a treaty was signed, the European Code of Conduct for Academic Integrity, in which it was put very explicitly that um, the academic is more has more integrity the less he or she is associated with uh, social groupings or economic involvement. Mm -hmm. European Code of Conduct, really, it's on the internet. Yeah. Um, Conflict of financial interest, in other words. Yeah? Just uh, no, not just the financial uh, interest, also the uh, ideological, uh, well, whatever you want to call it. So, um, I'm not saying I'm for that kind of definition of academic integrity, but you might uh, provoke reactions from... Yeah. Let's all take it turns. Oh, okay. uh, well, this actually also ties into the question that you had of do you see similarities between artists and academics? So. Uh, Yes, I, f I see that both worlds, artists and academics, have the tendency to uh, to work for themselves, and and um, and definitely artists are in constant double struggle. So, as an artist, I can consider myself only an artist when I when I you know delve into my work, and I, I I really I work with it in a kind of a passion and endurance and pain, and only from that can I create true art. Whereas for me, and this is why I call myself a filmmaker, I have to actively engage in, uh, in what I'm doing because I'm communicating something. I'm saying something to an audience. And I remember when I was um, 
uh, I was just starting out um, and I had this very strong tendency to feel like, you know, I, I'm, I'm making this and if I'm making this and why does it have to always say something or mean something or communicate a certain message? And I asked this to a, to, to a mentor and he said, well, that's bullshit. I mean, if you're, if you're making something, you're always making something, even if you don't realize it, but you're always communicating a message. And the, the thing that will differentiate you from being an artist to being actually a, a great artist is if you can, can understand that and make that step and then also transform your work into something that communicates something meaningful. That's Um, the only time I've ever heard any similar argument like that is in a tenure and promotion committee where young assistant professor's work was brought up and impeached on the basis that it was political and not scholarship. Um, and I think that's the most venomous and, and uh, something that in the academy we have to fight against any kind of... Um, any kind of principles like that, that they would... I don't know why they would call it a treaty or where it was, but I would say that right now you should be uh, signing petitions in order to get that overturned or, you know, ask how it would be applied legally within the context of tenure cases or in promotion cases in the European Union. I think it's a very dangerous thing to let just lie. I will just make two points about this. Firstly, in this part of the world, an essential part of the neoliberal agenda has been to discredit completely the arts and anything to do with culture. It has taken different forms in different places, but as you know very well, in the Netherlands, thanks to Wilders, the notion that arts and culture are nothing but a left-wing hobby has simply gone into common sense. Everybody believes that now, um, whether Wilders uh, makes it as a party or not. So um, the, one of the effects of this has been the actual freedom of expression of the artist has been cracked down massively, not only because of the depression that comes from poverty and having no future, but also in very, very distinctive ways. The latest um, information I have on this is by talking to Maria Lavajova, uh, who runs the contemporary arts platform here in Utrecht called The Buck, who will soon close. Maria has lost half, 50 percent of her budget uh, because her art, which is very conceptual, very political, has simply been downgraded to propaganda. She actually, they actually said, what you do is propaganda. So I hadn't heard this since the 1950s when I was a kid. She grew up in, in what is now um, the Czech Republic, so she had, had bad memories. So that, that is a real thing that we need to look at. Um, uh, we will have students not uh, taking anything artistic seriously, at the same time, all of them will do some DJing, VJing, some music composition because of the network society and the digital mediation that we're in. So there is a paradoxical construction there. Now, the um, second point I wanted to make concerns the context. This is the last of three conferences in the context of a massive commemoration of peace. And when we started this, we thought seriously how we would end, um, how we would bring all of this together. Even the, 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 the funding for this comes from the province of Utrecht uh, through this chair that they have endowed, which I, with a committee, got to define. And one of the key questions that we was, how do we think about cosmopolitan citizenship? How do we think about the unthinkability of peace? And what kind of thought process is art? When we submitted that proposal, um, because it had to go for approval back to the provincial council that, um, paid, that gave us the money, the right-wing party filed 43 objections that had to be responded by my vice chancellor and by Peter De Hahn, who is the leader of the commemoration. 43 objections, essentially because this was a propaganda left-wing program that didn't give any uh, right of reply to the populist right. And I must say, to the credit of my university, they said, of course they don't. Rose is running it. <laughs> Which I think is a delicious Dutch way of dealing with the complexity. In Italy, there would have been a civil war. Here, that's how they do it. Um, extraordinary. So this has a long, long history in terms of dealing with your question. And we really made a point to the very end of saying, you got objections? talk to me. And then, of course, um, it's, it's, it's part of the, the people who hate the older generation. It's part of being in a position 
where we are safe and secure. And so many of us radicalize in response to the horrendous context that we're in. Because actually, they can't do much to us. They can put you in a corner, they can ignore you, but they certainly are not going to shut down people like Greg Lambert and Paul Gillery of me. We will continue for as long as we can. Um, and I think in that sense, the pejorative sense of the tenured radicals has to be reviewed. Well, they tried to fire me last year. They tried to fire you, well. I, was, I survived. <laughs> well, we, so I think think of this in the context of a number of things that were said. Moment where we thank this panel, but in thanking them and their brilliance and their dedication, I had the pleasure of closing not only the conference but the commemoration of this complicated treaty. Long live peace and long live our guests. Thank you.